It is a delight to be back with you all tonight. I hope you can say the same, that it is good to be here. Before we get into our study, I have more books to give away. So, first are a couple of little ones called Ready Reference. The other is 4,000 question and answers on the Bible. So if you get this one, you don't have to put your questions in the question and answer box out there. You can just find them. And if they aren't in 4,000, I'm not sure about that. But there's that. And then there's a little study on Hebrews, Bible textbooks, more of a study guide type of thing. And then a larger book, The Scheme of Redemption by Robert Milligan. And this one was actually a, a, something I inherited from a man named Raymond Bush, a really good friend of mine that gave me his library. He actually died not long after that. But most of his library was in the basement of a church annex in Bethel, Alabama, or Athens, Alabama, congregation to Bethel, but that was destroyed by a tornado. So there, there is some water damage on at least this one, maybe this one. I, do, I couldn't find any mold. I've had to, unfortunately, throw away a few of his books because they were pretty moldy, but these just have some stiff pages. So there's that. I have another copy of it that he gave me. I don't normally give away his books, in case you're wondering about that. There's that. Same as before, first come, first serve. The price is too much for you to pay me, so... You just take them. Would you die for somebody? When I think of that, one of the things that comes to mind are the secret service, or is the secret service, or the people in the secret service. If I can get my grammar straight tonight. I think about even times when we've had presidents in this country that have been under attack, attempted, sometimes successful assassinations have occurred. And there are those individuals that are trained and intend to throw themselves in the path of a bullet or a blade or whatever it is. And it's their job to risk whatever it, it is in their personal risk to keep the, the, in this case, the president, although the idea can apply to other VIPs, I guess we would call them, keep them safe. But would you do that? You think you could do that? You could work in that kind of job. Are there people that you would be willing to say, I'll give my life if it came down to it, whether it is in an, to stop an act of violence or it's some other context where I can lay down my life for somebody else? Most, well, I'm not going to say most. Some people would say my spouse, my husband, my wife, especially maybe a husband to his wife as her protector, my kids. I'd give anything to save my kids. Take, take my life, take whatever. And then maybe you can go out from there. Who would you be willing to die for? Take out your Bible, if you would, please, and let's read together, or open up together, and then in a moment read together from Romans chapter 5. And in Romans 5, tonight, mainly 5 through 11, we're going to think together, we are thinking together tonight about the security of love. The security of love. Let's read together from the beginning of the chapter. We're going to go back to verse 1. And if you were here, and maybe you might remember, we looked at the first five verses as a part of our study last Sunday evening. We're not going to rehash all of that, I promise. But let's go back to the beginning of the chapter so we don't miss something that we might otherwise. Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. He writes, the Apostle Paul, by inspiration, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And then verse 5 of Romans chapter 5, And hope does not put us to shame. Hope does not disappoint us, this hope at least. And then read this part with me now. Because, here's why our hope is certain, because God's love has been poured into our hearts 
through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now tonight, in these, this next section, this next paragraph, if you want to call it that, of this chapter of Romans, it begins in verse 6 in English, in almost every English version with the word what? For. You could read that as another because. So our hope is certain because God's love has been poured out, has been experienced in our hearts. We felt it by the Holy Spirit. And then he says, here's more. 6 through 11 is more of what someone described as the logic of love. It's logical. This is all propositional. It's weak. This happens because of this. But this is one of the times in the letter to the Romans that Paul gets not just logical, he always is, but he gets really emotional. What Paul describes and sets forth for our reception tonight from these verses, they're not meant to just be learned as doctrine. They're not meant to be just something that we state. Yes, this is the truth. It is that. But much more than that, to borrow from the, word, the language of the text, they're meant to be felt. Can, can, I, can I say, can I use the word experience? I know sometimes that word gets a bad rap. And people, some people focus too much on being an experiential, religious, having a religious experience. That's not what I mean. But they're meant to be something that you actually experience in your life, in your heart. Not just something you could stand up if asked and quote. But more, deeper than that. Now as we look at these verses together... Let's look at two sides for our time in this text. The first side is us. Let's read verses 6 through 11. We're going to skip around just a bit. and Look at how Paul describes us. He does so directly a few times. He does so indirectly. But the point remains quite the same. As we look at us, let's read verse 6. Romans 5, 6, for while we, there we are, and he makes no distinction throughout this entire section, he makes no distinction between Jew, non-Jew, Roman, Greek, American, whatever you, whoever you are, whatever you are, you fit this we. The we here is humanity, humanity. For while we were still, first word, we. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, Romans 5 and verse 6. And if you're filling out the handout or you're taking notes tonight, I'd put that word down. You might put it in quotes, the word we. Or your Bible tonight, depending on your English version of choice, or copy that you have with you tonight, it might have, while we were still helpless. Have you ever been in that Scenario, have you ever felt helpless? The the word could also be the idea of sickly. You ever been sick? Hey, Jedediah, you need to sit down somewhere. Have you ever felt sickly? We usually use that word for physical illness or sickness, don't we? But here it's spiritual. Have you ever heard somebody say, they're, they're, they're maybe describing someone or a group of people that are sin sick. I do believe we sing a song that talks about, I think it's my sin sick soul. I'm probably misquoting that, but I'm not, that's not my area of expertise. That's the picture that's painted in this text. It's of somebody that's sick with an illness or someone that's a beggar and they can't help themselves. You could consider countless examples of individuals recorded in the gospel accounts or in the book of Acts that were blind or lame or paralyzed in some way and they had to have their friends carry them or they had to just sit all day in front of the temple. That's the idea. You get in that mode of thinking and picturing someone, picturing us as helpless, weak, sickly, unable to take care of ourselves, because of our own rejection, our own idolatry, our own sin, 
Now we're in this spot that we've made for ourselves. We've made our bed. What is it we say? Now you've got to lie in it. Now you stop. You can't get out. But then we already read in the rest of verse 6. What's that next word he uses to describe us? This one's more indirect because he says, while we were still help, helpless, Christ died for whom? The ungodly. I put that word down. You can take this word and simply look at the way that it's constructed in English. You have the word God in there, don't you? Ungodly. This describes us as people who are the opposite of our own creator. It is God himself that defines and creates what is right and holy and righteous and good and pure. You, you could, the list can keep going on and on. And he creates us in his image to be that. And then we turn away from that. We did and we do. And the Bible calls it ungodly. You could also say that it's not like God it's like anyone, it's more like Satan than God. Ungodly. I'm ungodly and I can't do anything about it. I'm weak. And then thirdly, we keep reading. We see then verse 8. We're going to drop down to verse 8. And if you can, try to skip the first part of the verse. And just read this second phrase, while where it starts in the ESV, we, there's we, we're still sinners. Christ died for us. It's the third word, sinners. sinners. Some of us know this one. If you break it down in a pretty basic way, it's missing the mark. You've probably heard that one before. As I read through Romans... I'm reminded that what that also means is a failed vocation. We've mentioned that before in some of these studies. I'm not going to get too deep into that tonight. But we were given, not only were we created a certain way, but we were created with certain tasks to give him glory, to reflect his glory. Go back to the beginning of the chapter, the hope of what? The glory of God, Romans 5.2. In context, he's talking about how we have that back. But when we had lost that, that's what he described us as sinners. This is one of the good times you can read that word like I often hear the Pharisees saying that word to Jesus. And it's something like, sinners. Those sinners. Those sinners are right here. That's us. Then verse, the fourth one. Look at the next two verses, 9 and 10. We're going to drop down to verse 10 as we think about this last word. It says, For if while we were enemies, enemies, do you have any enemies tonight? No, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands on that one. Are there people that it just seems like they, they're disgusted with you? They maybe even hate you? Well, they're out there. Just because you're a Christian, there are people that hate you. Maybe you just haven't met them yet. Or perhaps you have. But that's what this means. The us, because of our ungodliness and our sin, whether it was more direct like people even today who will say, I hate Jesus. Talk about social media. Just this past week, I saw some people discussing. I'm not even going to say it. I think it might fall under what Paul said you shouldn't even talk about. But some people discussing something that was about the height of blasphemy against Jesus. They were having a good time talking about it. But you see, those are the people we can easily look at and say, yeah, today even, those people, they hate God. It might not be so comfortable to turn the mirror around and 
say, that, that was me. Yeah, I might have grown up, grew up in a good Christian home, going to church, reading my Bible. But before Jesus, before I was in Jesus, that was me. The enemy. Thus, was God. That's our side of the, the picture of the coin. Let's look at the other side. We've already read some of these verses that describe this, so we're going to go back through now and look at it from the other's angle. Recently, on Wednesday evenings, in the youth class over in the Family Center, we looked at, spent a couple of nights discussing and talking about abortion. And I mentioned to them, shared with them, that it's one of those topics that I, I'm, I like to talk about. I, I like to discuss it with people in the world, and, but it's also one of those topics I don't like to talk about. I don't even like to think about. I don't know that there's a topic I love to talk about privately, publicly, to preach or teach or study with someone or, or just converse with someone about than the cross of Jesus. It's what it's all about. Christ and Him crucified. But I also don't know of a quote, topic that I don't like to talk about anymore than this one. Let's read it again. When we see him, we see his death. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. We read that while we were still weak at the right time, in the perfect planning of divine providence, wisdom, and foreknowledge, Christ the long-awaited Messiah, the King of glory, the King of the ages, died. And then he says in verse 7, For one will scarcely, it is rare that one will die for a righteous person. We started there this evening. There are stories in history, more recent, like assassinations of presidents. There are stories of home invasions where spouses have laid down their life lay down their lives for their children, for their spouse. And Paul says that does happen. But for someone to lay down their life for a righteous person, and you can almost put that in quotes for Paul, given even this context, is there really a righteous person on their own? But he says, you pick out somebody you think is good, I think it's part of the idea, a good person, an upstanding citizen, Somebody that loves you and you love, yeah, you might die for them. But then keep going. He says, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die, but God, we're going to stop there, but has Christ died for us, end of verse 8, died for the ungodly, verse 6. And we were what we just listed. Even with my preaching, we still... Most of us left here not long after, or probably between about a quarter to noon and a little afternoon. If you're like me, you went out to eat somewhere for Sunday lunch or dinner, if you call it that, and then maybe you, you might have went home, rest. Did you watch TV? Well, whatever, whatever you did this afternoon, and then you came back, quarter to five, ten till, five till, five. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. How long is that? Let, let's say four hours. Pick four hours. Sunday afternoon. Can you imagine hanging on a cross? With what one writer said should have been the thunderbolts of divine wrath, but instead are the bolts of steel from the Roman hands. Can you imagine hanging there? From the time you roughly left the church building this morning and came back tonight. 
four hours of the most intense agony and humiliation ever known before or after by humanity. And Paul doesn't say all of that. But when you read Romans 5, verse 6, Christ died for the ungodly, and then it's more personal in verse 8. Christ died for, what does it say? Us. At first, we read those words and weep, but then... I have to read those words and think, T-H-A-N-K. And then from one standpoint, I'm, I'm rejoicing. Because Christ died for us. The weak, ungodly sinners who were hating what does that mean then, Paul? Now let's read all of verse 8. When I look at him, I see his love. But God shows his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, just to make sure we don't get the wrong idea that, it, that we somehow we started fixing ourselves and we got to where God said, okay, when you get to this point, when you're worthy, just a little, may, at least, of my... Well, we were still sinners, unfaithful, ungodly. Christ died for us. Take a good, good look at the tenses. You don't have to know Greek. You don't have to even really know English. It's pretty simple. Christ died for us. What is that? Past tense. It's an historical event. God shows his love for us. God poured out his love into our hearts, verse 5. What does that mean, Paul? Verse 8, it means Christ died for us, and now present tense, put them together, God is still showing his love. Every time I go back to the cross, every time I read about the cross, every time I feel the love of God. Or at least I, I should and I can. Every time it says to me, it declares to me, it's an experience I'm meant to experience that God loves me. The weak. Then I also see in verse 9 his blood. Look at verse 9. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by, well, verse 1 says, by faith. But what is our faith in? Somebody says, well, it's in Jesus. Amen. What did Jesus do? In part, in large part, he shed his blood. We are justified by his blood. Much more shall I be saved by him from the wrath of God. I see his blood. A blood that has the power to cleanse every sinful stain. When I put the death and the love of Jesus and God's love together, part of what that then means in my life tonight is that there is no depth of sin, there is no distance of departure from my God as a Christian or before I become a Christian that is not unreachable by the death and love of my Savior, Jesus. He shed His blood to cleanse us. And then look at verse 10. Last one for him. He says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, there's His death again, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Now what does that mean? I get his death, his blood. What does his life mean? Could it mean his resurrection? Could it mean 
His current ascended throne, as He reigns as the King, the King who did not come with an army to destroy us, the King who did not come as a great philosopher. Because an army and a philosopher, philosophy, those are not the greatest powers in the universe. The greatest power in the universe. I'm convinced is love. And the greatest love in the universe is right here. God's love, divine love. And the one that loved me and died for me now lives to save me eternally by his blood, by his death, by his own current immortal We see us, and then we see him. I do find it interesting that sometimes when we teach people the gospel, the good news about Jesus, we focus sometimes (laughs) exclusively on what we need to do. Now, I'm not telling anybody tonight to quit telling people what they need to do to become a Christian. Don't, please don't misunderstand me. But if we're not careful, I mean, look at Romans 5, 6 through 11. Does Paul say anything here about we, what we must do? Now, there are plenty of places where Paul does. Don't get Paul wrong. But sometimes, we may get a bit too much emphasis on, well, you've got to do this, 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 and this. And it's easy, it's on one hand, isn't it? unless you throw in the sixth one. But the emphasis in the Bible is on what God has done and is doing through Jesus. And then, what else am I going to do but respond as he has written in his words for me to respond to the gospel? But the gospel, if you put it in one phrase, is Romans 5, 8, Christ died for us. That's the good news. Then you can say, now what are you going to do about that? Do you believe it? Do you embrace it? Do you live it? Will you obey it initially and turn away from your idolatry? Motivated by the blood of Jesus and then washed in the blood of Jesus and what we usually call baptism? And then raised to have a life like Jesus? That's what I see when I see us and I see him. Then here's the result. And here's what we'll end on tonight. It's in three parts, but they're quick. The result is one that we are now friends with God. People that were enemies with God are now reconciled by God back to God. Have you noticed that God is never said to be reconciled to us in Scripture? Because God wasn't the enemy. We made ourselves enemies of God by our rebellion. And now God, through Jesus, is calling us and bringing us back to himself. Now we have peace with God, Romans 5.1. Now the prodigal gets to come home. We get to be friends with God. And if that doesn't light a fire in our souls. I don't know what will. I'm friends with God because of Jesus. Now keep in mind, Paul says this is God's love too. This is the love of the Father. It's not like Jesus comes and saves us from the Father who's so angry. I'm a friend. And then secondly tonight, I can know, we can know the future. Look at verse 10 and 11 again. He says, if we were enemies, God reconciled us by the death of his son. Much more, it's this common Jewish much more, from the great now to even greater, but in one sense lesser. He says, now that we shall be reconciled, now that we are reconciled, shall, future, we be saved by his life. He'd already noted that we're going to be saved from the wrath that is to come earlier in these verses. How do you know tonight what's going to happen on the Day of Judgment? 
How do you know that as a disciple of Jesus, God is going to say, enter into the joys of your Lord? It is not because you say, well, I'm a faithful Christian. Yeah, you'd better be, <laughs> because of the gospel. The reason I tonight know 100% or more, if you could go higher in the math, what Jesus is going to do, what God is going to do on the day of judgment for me, is because God loves me. Why? Christ died for me. Now, if there's any comparison that pales in comparison, it is this one. But it's like somebody that drives across the country 2,000 miles to be with their family, and they get there, they pull in the driveway, and they sit in their car the whole time. Paul's saying, if God sent his son to die for you, then in, in one way, the rest of the story and delivering you from his wrath on the day of judgment so you don't get the judgment, the condemnation, you get the eternal life. I, I don't mean this to belittle it, but that's the easy part now much more than that. And then verse 11, and as we read the last verse of our text, we will bring things to a close ourselves. Verse 11 says, we rejoice, or yes, we boast. Verse 11, more than that, we also rejoice. And there are some versions that translate it as boast, because that is also what the word means. But unlike many who boast in their intellect, in their job, in their accomplishments, he says, we boast, we can stand confidently, and we can stand and rejoice, we can jump up and down with excitement. Why? And who? In God, who's done what? Who through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And if you go back to verse 2 and verse 3, you read that word two more times. You already read it tonight. Rejoice. Rejoice. It's the same word. Now, Paul has already told us not to boast. In Romans 2, he says, don't boast. In Romans 3, he says, don't boast. It's 217, 327, if you want to mark them down. And then in 4 2, chapter 4, three chapters in a row up to this point, Paul says, no, you shouldn't be boasting. And then he turns right around and uses the exact same word, although we don't always translate it the same way, and says, you should be boasting. Same emotion, different, completely different context, completely different way that it is processed out. So that I can stand... I can know that I am going to be with Jesus forever because I am a friend of God. How do I know that? And more than just know, how do I feel the joy and the boast? Because God shows his love because Christ died for us. Now Brad selected an invitation song. I already told you if you were marking to mark. And I, I don't have anything else to say. Because there is not anything greater. I, said, I know I said I didn't have anything else to say, but I hope you get what I mean. But there's not anything greater than this. There is no sign. There is no message. There is no event that can have a greater change and power to capture our hearts so that we do respond appropriately to the gospel. Then the gospel, it says, there was a king, 
And his faith was so marred, he couldn't even tell he was human anymore. But he'd been exalted to rescue those who belong to him. As we stand together and sing. What will you do with Jesus? As the question comes to you, and you must give an answer. 